the sad part is most people that I talk to in their 40s and 50s, they have two assets that they can't touch. Equity in their home, which is extremely expensive to get to, and qualified retirement market. Dude, I have a finance degree from a very good college, and not one of those classes in the beginning, they told you to even get a credit card. It's like, what in the hell? How do they not teach you that, like, right when you get in the eighth grade? You're investing in yourself or in your education and your ability versus giving money to Wall Street to the crooks in Manhattan in a government-controlled asset called a qualified retirement account that you can't touch or use until you're 60 years old. That's gambling. I know people in their 60s, they go, man, I wish I would have met you 20 years ago. They both make about $125,000 in their engineering jobs. They're both in their mid-20s. They made $300,000 in their first year of real estate doing it part-time. But they're like, well, we don't want to leave our jobs. Like it's, it's like, guys, what is your time worth? You got to start respecting yourself, respecting your time, because you guys just created that doing it half ass. But I don't want to have the what if moments when I'm 60, like everybody else. And when the government talks about inflation is slowing, inflation is down, it doesn't mean it's back to where it was. And it doesn't even mean that inflation has stopped. When they say inflation is slowing, it means it's not 8% this month, it's only five. It's still higher than where it was a month ago. And they're saying it's slowing. That doesn't mean it's gonna go What's up everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Cashflow Conversations. Today we have a special guest with Tommy Har out of the beautiful city of Columbus, Ohio. And uh, I grew up most of my life in Ohio, so I know I know exactly where you're from. Uh, it's good to have you here, man. Tommy owns a company called Legacy Homes and uh, does investing for long-term rentals and real estate flips. And what a crazy market we have right now. So I'm eager to dive in into what he sees, the opportunities and what to stay away from in the next few months. So Tommy, it's good to have you here, man. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, always love the opportunity to share my story and dig into what you got going on as well. So thank you. Absolutely, dude. So but it's funny, before this, we were talking about, um, you know, everybody has this journey of W-2 to 1099. Um, we're taught to go to college, you know, growing up, uh, you're from the Columbus area, right? Yeah, born and raised. Okay. So I was born in Michigan and I'm a Michigan State fan. So I guess we, we still could get along because I'm not a U of M fan. But uh, I'm definitely not a Buckeye fan. I'll start off with that. <laughs> <laughs> not many people are, especially if you're if you if you don't like them, you usually hate them. There's, so like, there's no in between, is there? No, absolutely not. Um, I love it. So, but you know the uh, the idea of going from W two to ten ninety nine is always a journey, and you don't have everybody in your corner rooting for you. So, you, yeah. when we were before this, we were talking about you. Uh, you went to college, and you have an interesting degree in business and entrepreneurship. What was that like? Yeah, so um, I, I played soccer at the University of Dayton. So uh, went there, and so you got to get a degree if you're playing sports, right? So I was like, okay, I like money, and so I, I was like, okay, finance seems like it'd be, be cool. And then my dad's an entrepreneur, so I was like, yeah, hey, they have a good entrepreneurship program, whatever that means. So uh, decided to double major because a lot of the classes coincided anyway. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna get a double major and and just go for it. I love it. So that's cool. Uh, so you played soccer in college, and then you had to get the degree because you were there. So it's like a pretty much. It's like an ancillary benefit, I guess. Because I always tell people never let never let uh, uh, college get in the way of your education. And I think you yeah, yeah, exactly. Had a good time. Um, won an A ten championship when I was there. Met some really good people. Don't apply much of what I learned, other than like maybe selling, trying to meet meet women, all that stuff. You know. How I <laughs> Well, it works. So congratulations on the recent marriage, by the way. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I love it because entrepreneurship, going to college for entrepreneurship is kind of like an oxymoron. Yeah. Yeah. They, the only cool thing, and I completely forgot about this, is they gave us like $5,000 of seed money. So there's a program your sophomore year. Uh, you have to get into that program. So you have to have good enough grades and all that stuff, which is so weird. Yeah. And so we basically... There, there's bracelets called Alex and Ani at the time, and they were blowing up. And we had a girl in our group that said, hey, there's no date in one. We can make them on in China and get them shipped in. So I was the salesman for it. So I was going from every girl's dorm room trying to sell these bracelets. I was like, this is sweet. I can do this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, man. And then so after college, you got in the family business with home inspections. Yep. What was that? Yep. Yeah. So growing up, my dad had two businesses, one uh, home inspections, which I didn't know much about. Uh, I grew up really in the property preservation side of it. So when the banks were foreclosing on everything, we were boarding out the houses or boarding up the houses, changing the locks, winterizing them, uh, mowing the lawns. So I did a lot of trash outs, a lot of mowing when I was 13, 14, all the way to maybe 18. 
Uh, but I always told my dad I was going to help him out. I'm one of five kids, the oldest boy. So it just felt like it was kind of my duty or maybe the right thing to do. And I didn't know what else to do. I, I, would, I played sports. So I was like, okay, I'm going to come back and help you. Uh, little did I know the that business had dissolved right around the time that I was graduating college. Less foreclosures, less, less bank money. Um, so I just became a home inspector. So basically... I call it my, the apprenticeship model, just followed my dad around like a puppy dog and he pointed stuff out and I was like, okay, I can get it and just picked it up that way. So it took a year or so to really learn it and uh, but I was able to, it was just him. So I've been able to build the business marketing and sales and kind of learn the entrepreneurship side of it as well while I was doing it. Cool. I got a master's in architecture in 08 and that was when the housing market collapsed. Yeah. The housing market was saturated with homes and here I am getting a degree in how to design homes. <laughs> not a not a great uh profession at that time. No, it was horrible time. It couldn't have been worse timing, which is the blessing in disguise because you have to learn how to pivot. Um but back then I got a really good job at a high end firm and you know the Uber rich didn't feel the recession because they understand well, they have a lot of money to play with and they understand how money actually works. But what I recognized is from two thousand eight until just recently, the housing market has done nothing but go up. Yep. And you get a lot of people that are your age, right? Um, 30, that has never, even even 40 year olds have never experienced a down market in the real estate world. Yeah. Now, I believe that people make money in bull markets and bear markets, but navigating that is a new territory for a lot of people that were really successful. And if you were over leveraged, like, like I have a HELOC. And that read is not nearly what it was today than when I bought my house, you know, two years ago. And so that, that really hurts. So, so people can't afford this. So what do you see, what do you see happening here in the market uh, for people that have floating rates that have completely changed? Yeah. So commercial is buying at future prices and all these three, one, five, one arms are coming up and adjusting, meaning their, their net operating income is going to go down and commercial real estate is directly valued versus your net operating income versus the cap rate. So cap rates are uh, going down and your net operating income going down as well. So those those properties are worth less. So there's a lot of people that borrowed a lot of other people's money doing that. So they're getting underwater on these things and owing people a lot of money. So I think commercial is, is going to be the first to see it. Uh, and it already is happening. Residential, um, I think, yeah, the, the unaffordability is happening. And I'm in a market like Columbus where we can pivot from selling to renting. I like to stay in that first time home buyer range. So if I can't sell a house, I'm going to rent it. And the cool thing, uh, not for everybody, but for me, is if unaffordability happens for first time home buyers, where do they have to go? Do they have to rent? So then they they could have afforded a, a nice mortgage payment, but now they can't. So they're going to rent for the next couple of years until they can. So it's going to bring more renters into the market and it's going to allow for um, people to landlords specifically one to four units to be able to get through whatever's happening. Uh, you sent a lot of industry jargon. Can I pick some of this apart really quick? So everybody understands what you're talking about. Absolutely. You mentioned NOI net operating income. Yep. Uh, what does yep. that mean for everybody listening? Yeah. So net operating income is what you take home at the end of the day net. So in your pocket, what are you making? So you got your gross income, which is going to be, let's look at a commercial building, all your rent. So your rent and if people pay utilities to you, that's going to be your gross. And then you have an, you have operating expenses. So you have, uh, you got your mortgages, you have your uh, lawn maintenance, you have all these things that come out of that. And then you have your funnel to the bottom, which is your net. And that is a, a direct, at least five units and above. There's a direct multiplier called your cap rate that is going to, uh, based off the area, that's going to be de determined how much that property is worth. So it's net operating income divided by cap rate and you equal that. Cap rate, what is cap short for? Is it capital rate? Uh, capitalization rate. Yeah. So that basically means how much revenue you're going to get uh, on average in that area. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. So NOI, net operating income, capitalization rate. And then you uh, mentioned the opportunity for first-time home buyers in the residential space. So how often and have you ever done like a land contract for a uh, possible renter? Renter possible. Honestly, I've never... I've never done it, um, but as the markets change like this, rent to own land contract is much for, like it's better for a lot of people that are maybe hurting for cash landlord wise, uh, because you can get a decent down payment and somebody that's going to take care of the property 
as well as still getting your cash flow from your uh from your rent and you're in control yeah you you the yep. owner are in control if like if they default or can't make up then it goes probably goes right back to you yep you know right now with rates going through the roof uh you see a lot of good guys out there you know pace morbies of the world creative financing Talk to me about some creative financing, because to me, that seems like a pretty creative way to like, if you're sitting on a property, maybe you can't sell for what you want, but you can give the first time home buyer an opportunity to gain. One, I think that that land contract is a good idea, but when I say creative financing, what do you think of? Yeah, I think of two things, uh, owner financing and subject to. So subject to is a short for subject to the existing mortgage. So say somebody really wants to sell um, and they're unrealistic with their price, but they have great debt on their property. So you can essentially what's called you, you take it's a mortgage takeover. So there's two times there's an there's an assumable mortgage and then there's basically a takeover. So an assumable means that I qualify and that literally that loan gets put in my name. That doesn't really ever happen unless it's like a VA, um, a veterans loan. But if it's a uh, regular person conventional, now there is a due on sale clause. We can talk about that stuff here. But you're basically just taking title of the property and you're making payments on their behalf. So the seller still has that mortgage on their credit, but they're relieving their problem of not being able to pay their mortgage. So if I default, what the the who's in trouble? The the seller. So if, if I don't pay it, they're still on that. So that's the risk for them. But usually they're so motivated, they're like, I can't get my number, nobody will pay me, but I can't pay my payment. So it's either foreclosure or it's you take over the payments. You, there's a lot of trust involved and um, you can write in some things into the contract saying like who's at fault, but it, it eventually essentially goes down to the um, to the owner who's ever on the mortgage. Because I find that interesting. I have friends that like everyone, you know, Airbnb space and man, when rents or when uh, mortgage rates were under 3%, a rental property is cash flowing like crazy. 8%. Crazy. 8% rates, get rid of all the profit. But the the challenge that I've heard with subject to is if a lender lends me money and now you're going to assume the loan, the bank's going, who are you? Exactly. So what, I mean, yeah, you so, know how easy it is, but is it really that easy? Um, yeah. So it's kind of like a don't ask, don't tell situation. So you don't, technically every loan has a due on sale clause. So once they, that title transfers to the next person, the bank will be like, yo, whoa, 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 hold up. Who is this person? Like, this is not assumable. This is not a assumable. Mortgage. Most every note mortgage has a non-assumable clause in it because they went to you. You're, they, they went on your DTI, your credit, all that stuff. But at the end of the day, a lot of these servicers and, and lenders, they aren't funneling through the millions of loans they've written. And if it's being paid, they're not really gonna, to, they're not gonna look at it. So as long as you're making payments on time, and not raising any red flags, then it should be okay. But it's that's kind of the gray space of that whole entire uh, subject to uh, world. I find that risky. Yeah, I do too. I do too. Okay. I don't do a lot of those. We've done probably three or four of them, but we wholesaled them. So we, uh, them. we yeah, yeah, we we sold it to somebody and made a fee in the middle, and uh, they're taking on that that risk. So when you say wholesale and real estate, we're talking about so much right now, but wholesale is another term for you. When you say that, what does that mean? Yeah. So wholesaling is, so it's essentially the backbone of my business. So it's it's flipping the house without ever owning it. So if I get in contract at $100,000 on a house, off market typically, uh, we reach out to the seller via marketing, text, whatever it is. They agree at 100. I know an investor down the street, my buddy will pay 120. I then... Uh, sign that contract. So basically this, the end buyer agrees to this and you make $20,000 in the middle, right on the settlement statement. You never own it, you never swing a hammer and you just, you're a line item on the settlement statement. It's a, a crazy, awesome uh, hamster wheel business though. It's, you're always chasing deals. You're a glorified, I mean, don't take offense to this, correct me if I'm wrong. No. It sounds like a glorified realtor that- yeah has a bigger audience? Like what's the value there? Why would a seller go to a wholesaler versus a real estate agent? So the, the value proposition for a wholesaler is typically, um, your problem solver. So a realtor is usually, they try to plug themselves into one box. Like, Hey, I can list your house, <laughs> but that's it. So like, Hey, I can list your house. So what, what we're doing is saying, Hey, uh, you, maybe you're a hoarder. Maybe it's, maybe the house is absolutely trash. Maybe you don't want anybody to walk this house. 
Like, what's the other option? If you list the house, people are going to want to walk in. So we come in and we solve that problem. Or maybe they want to live in the house for another three months after they get paid. So we're basically trying to figure out the motivation of the seller. Once we know it, we can solve the problem. So it's a lot of phone sales. It's a lot of uh, rapport building. And once you know it, you can solve it. But as a realtor, it's just like, hey, um, I know you have this problem. I can list the house for this. Um, but or yeah, so we're that middleman. It's kind of the call it the wild, wild west of real estate. Uh, there's a lot of people doing it really uh, good and ethically. There's a lot of people doing it very poorly and they don't care about the seller as much, which is, in my opinion, really bad business, but it happens. Um, I want to get back to the sub two thing here because it's really catching on online and yeah. my concern outweighs my excitement to go do it. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Like, cause I, I feel like if the bank decides to actually what you what I heard you say was if they don't catch it, you know, they have millions of loans. They're not going to catch it. How would, how would you get in trouble? Yeah. You know, that's like being, that's like saying, yeah, I'm pretty gray on my taxes. I haven't been audited, you know? Exactly. <laughs> and for the government, yeah, so I mean, I, I take care of all my taxes correctly. I have a CPA every yeah. above board. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, I'm not gonna lie. I'm not the expert expert on it. I can speak on a high level on it, but there is ways to get around the due on sale. I I'm assuming it's mostly like applying through their portal because they don't want to foreclose, right? They don't want to wow. take it back. So if they look, they're probably going to look at you as the borrower and say, okay, who are you? Can we make this work? So you talk to the bank, you talk to the underwriter, you say, okay, here's what I'm doing. Here's why we did this. And you can get around it. Um, so if we're, if we're speaking about like Pace Morby, he, he's had videos on how to do that. I just don't, I've never watched them. Yeah. I feel like if you did it the right way, it's a heck of a way to, like if you could figure out a legit way where the bank knows everything above board, you're not going to get hit with some surprise two years down the road, yeah. you know? Yeah. There is um, in the assumable side, but let, like the only assumable that I know are like VA loans. So, but there's more stipulations to it. So you have to actually apply. You have to get, they have to run your credit. Basically you're like, you're going for a new mortgage, but you just take over the same terms. You know, but that's still attractive when new rates are eight and that rate might be three and a half. Yeah. That might be it just added. Lo- it just lowers your pool of buyers because typically a VA is a con- it's gonna be like it's gonna be on your credit type thing. And a lot of these savvy investors, they want to do it in their LLC. And if they can't uh qualify DTI wise, which is a giant thing for the conventional space, you you may not be able to have that opportunity. Interesting. Interesting. All right, let's talk about your bread and butter then. Wholesale and long-term rentals. Okay, yeah. So, so, yeah, go ahead. No, so that, that's that's really where you focus with legacy homes, right? Yeah, so we have, I would say like it's, it's, it's completely vertically integrated. So everything starts with wholesaling. So everything in real estate starts with a deal. Wholesaling is just an exit strategy. So we're trying to find super discounted off-market real estate. So with that, we typically have houses that need a lot of work. So we have three spokes of the wheel. We can wholesale it out to an end buyer, make quick cash, the quickest cash, no risk cash. We can buy it with other people's money with these two other spokes. We can flip it, sell it on the market, or we can buy it, flip or flip it. But instead of selling it on the market, we refinance, capture that equity and get a long-term debt on the property and hold it as a rental. So we manage all of our properties in house. We, uh, yeah, we do all that stuff in house, so we have the opportunity to do all of it. And when you say other people's money, you uh, you accept investor funds, correct? So it's private. Yeah, yeah, private investors. Whether it's uh, cash savings, whether it's a self directed IRA, if it's a life value or a, 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 a life insurance policy, if it's a lending against a stock portfolio, a HELOC, whatever it is. So liquid cash is just liquid cash. So being able to tap into it and educate people on how they can do it and make double digit returns, 10, 12, 14% backed by a real tangible asset that they're lending on. Yeah. I always talk about hard assets going up with inflation. Yeah. So gold, silver, um, and real estate, because I can see and touch it. And the proof is for Zillow. Go on Zillow and try and find a deal. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. With these rates. I mean, if you buy a cash, if you buy a property to try and cash flow, it'll cover the debt. And if you can find one that's not, that does more than that, I mean, that's a gem. Yeah, those deals are really hard in hitting Zillow. So, I mean, to kind of answer your question, going back to the beginning of like, kind of is the market going to crash or anything like that? The supply is still so low and like there's still so many buyers out there 
that no, people are just getting a little pickier, yeah. which is kind of normal. So everybody got used to not normal situations to where hopefully the the bad players just fall out and, and it gives more opportunity to people that, that know the game. A year ago, a little over a year ago, I saw a statistic where there's like an eight to nine million housing shortage for how many people are actually looking for homes. And the joke, the millennials and the, and the Gen Z still living in mom and dad's house because they can't afford yeah. it. And no. it's not going to come down. The thing that's funny about inflation, and I could talk about inflation a lot, but what's funny about inflation is um, hard assets go up. And when the government talks about inflation is slowing, and inflation is down. It doesn't mean it's back to where it was. And it doesn't even mean that inflation has stopped. When they say inflation is slowing, it means it's not 8% this month. It's only five. It's still higher than where it was a month ago. And they're saying it's slowing. That doesn't mean it's going to go back. When would the reason that the 2008 banking crisis happened is because banks got uh, greedy. They let money that didn't exist on assets that were going through the roof. And the, the, and the, the pricing was ridiculous. And then like to your point earlier, banks don't want to be holding on to real estate at all. They want the debt. They don't want the physical asset. So they'll be willing to work with you on those sales. But right now, I don't think we have that problem. When when COVID happened and all these, the trillions of dollars went out, I used to talk all the time about how inflation is going to be crazy and the money is going to end up in the hands of the wealthy again. Sure. You know, people who got a $2,000 check went out and bought a new purse or a watch or whatever. And meanwhile, wealthy people understand that that money should be going into hard assets because now I, if I have 100, I can now borrow 400. I can buy five hundred thousand dollar asset now, so I, I I don't see housing prices coming down. And as everyone talks about, as interest rates come down, the housing that that just props up the pricing because more people want to get involved because the the cost is cheaper. If they drop, and so, if and when, if and when they drop, um, sorry to cut you off, but if and when they drop, hedge funds are not buying right now. By the way, um, and hedge funds have more money than God. So once they figure out what's going on in the market and they start buying again. If you think you're getting a better deal by waiting for rates drop, it's going to be astronomical. If you think you can play against, uh, like if, if I flip a house and I have an FHA buyer, which is a first time home buyer loan versus in the same offer, maybe more via cash closing 10 days with, from a hedge fund, which one do you think I'm taking? <laughs> I'm taking this one because like as much as everybody's like, well, we got to like, help out and all that stuff. It's like, these people want their money. Like, the flippers will want their money. They 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 honestly don't really care as much to to help out a person that they don't know or whatever it may be. So it's 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 tough. Yeah, that, the it's scary, and there's opportunity in there. Some there, the, you know, in architecture, you are presented with a problem every semester, not a project, a problem, and the, and you have to find the solution. And yeah. the economy is the same thing. Money is the same thing. There's problems that exist. How can you fix that problem? And entrepreneurs are the serial problem solvers. Yeah. Right? So how can I solve this problem more creative than somebody else? So where do you, I, I hear you saying the value really is in the off-market deals that might require work where a newbie wouldn't yeah. want to tackle that project. Yeah. And they don't have the know-how. They don't, they don't, unless you've educated yourself. Uh, I educated myself basically free stuff, so podcast books, things like that. Um, but you gotta, you gotta go where the less competition is. So I want to be talking to a seller where it's just me and him or her. Whereas if you go and you just search Zillow all day, you may get lucky, but you're fighting against people. Like I'm in Columbus, Ohio, like you said earlier, people from California with way more money than most people that I know are, are trying to buy those same assets. And a three, a 4% return is maybe decent for them because they're just trying to park their capital. And I'm looking for a 20% cash on cash return that it, you're going to get blown out of the water price wise. So you just got to learn how to fight with less people, meaning off market. And typically that means you got to figure out how to raise capital, which is going to be private money or hard money. One of the two. All right. Two conversations, capital, raising capital and location. You know, the old adage, location, location, location. Um, where do you see opportunity right now in real estate markets for off market deals? country rural areas uh downtown columbus with uh college students as being renters like what do you think um i like a mixed bag but i always like workforce housing so b minus c ish areas 
Um, and also they call it path of progress. So places that are, are not quite great yet, but they're affordable and they're, they're, things are changing that way. So if you can get in the middle of those and add value by fixing up these houses, because investors really are the first step in that process. They spot the opportunity, they may, maybe the government in those areas grant money. And then after that, they're, they're now, uh, you're fixing the you're fixing the problem. You're cleaning up areas. So if you could sit yourself in those seats, that's how you generate great equity long term, and that's how you kind of change your life in the beginning. So sit yourself in those, and then as you build a lot of active income or you have a nice portfolio, start anchoring when A and B class properties that are going to never lose value. They're going to have great renters that don't turn that much. Um, so I think you got to start thinking about different areas provide different things. It depends on how much capital and how much net worth you have. Um, but in the beginning, if you don't have a lot of money, uh, one, you got to make more money somehow, whether it's active income flipping and then start parking in those areas that you can actually afford. So huge advocate. Number one way to fix your social status is fix your income because you're in control of that. Yeah. And then the last podcast, we had a great conversation with Kevin Miller. Uh, and he said, when I hear people saying they're stuck in their job, it's a joke. And he talked about how he made a website, making 50 grand a year and it's completely hands off. And it's just amazing. Yeah, I love it. But so you're saying fix your income and then buy what's affordable and then buy into higher end real estate. So it might be not a sexy project up front. It might be a $60,000 rehab that you can sell for 10, 15, 20% profit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's how my first one, the first one was I bought it for 54,000, put 15 grand into it. I did a lot of the work. How perfect. Oh, Fifteen grand. Besides your college education, which was completely worth it, U of D. Uh, I don't want to be out of scholarship or anything. But when was the last time before that? When when did you spend fifteen grand on something? Oh man, nothing, bro. How that's the cool part. Like you drop. How how fun was it? Your emotional rate of return to talk to your friends and family about I dropped fifteen grand on this project. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. And then I mean, everybody wants to be in real estate too, so they're following along with your journey and the social media side is is cool as well. Um, we sold the house for 130. Uh, I actually had a financial partner on that deal and I, she let me like 65 grand. I gave her $65,000 and $25,000 on top of that, a check back to her. And I made $25,000 and that was like in four months. So her return was just like almost 50%. And I mean, it was just stupid. So in the beginning, especially if you want to get into real estate and doing off market stuff and using other people's cash, it's going to be people that trust no love you as a person because there is inherent risk in in those in those deals i mean you can completely screw up a really good deal if you've never done it before so would your recommendation be uh working with somebody who's done it the first few times yes absolutely so there's there's three ways to do it in my opinion so number one is going to be uh find a really good deal and go partner with somebody in your area that does this all day every day for a living Really quick, and then keep the next two, but I, I want to point out for someone who get, who's getting started, you're not bringing a lot of value to the equation, especially if you need other people's money. So the value that you can bring to the equation is finding the deal that's not on Zillow. Unless you have some, like maybe you're 30, 40 years old or, or whatever it is, and you have crazy career capital and something that that other person wants to learn. So like, hey, I can maybe find a deal or, hey, I know tech. I can build your website. Just bring me a lot of deal or something other than money. But typically it's going to be a deal. So you you need the deal. And because if you come to a person like me, I didn't have that deal before. So you're, I'm not, you're creating a, a, a situation where I'm benefiting mutually monetarily. And now I'm just plugging that deal into my system. It's just another deal we have going on. It's free money. And then that other person's getting a free education and getting paid for it. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. All right, so the next two that you, you were going to mention. So the next one is going to be pay a mentor uh, to learn in the, on the front end before you get the deal. Yeah. So pay a mentor, educate yourself paid wise. And then three is going to be find a rock star general contractor that you can trust with everything, which is about as rare as, as anything else. So in my opinion, finding a deal and taking it to somebody and asking them to partner is the best way to do it because you can learn their systems, you can meet their contractors, you can learn everything, and you still and you get paid for it. It's paid education. If you got a contractor, not only is that a diamond in the rough, you would have to have the deal and some capital lined up 
exactly. But now, exactly. So if you bring it for that, because you know, if you're a badass contractor, then you probably don't need a lot of help. And if you can give that, so the way to get them involved would be giving them a portion of that uh, upside. Yeah, yeah. Not so it would be a specific situation. It has to be a perfect situation where that contractor has never really invested, and you like kind of put the bug in their ear, like, "Hey, if I find a deal, will you do it with me?" You have the construction, maybe you also have the money. Um, that would be the only way it could work. But typically, if you bring a deal to me, I'll, I, I'll, I always say to everybody, I will bring the construction and I'll bring the money. Because I didn't have that deal before. And it feeds my guys. It feeds my team. Um, it's just another uh, hole in the bucket. I love it. And so how easy is it to get involved with a, a company like yours? Like, let's say, dude, the sad part is most people that I talk to in their 40s and 50s, they're, they have two assets that they can't touch. Equity in their home, which is extremely expensive to get to, and qualified retirement money. Most people that I talk to have in the in their forties have hundreds of thousands in retirement for retirement. You know, the, the, if we live another twenty years, God knows how much I'm going to have to give to the IRS. God knows what the market's going to do. Thank God my uh, my financial advisor with the monogram cuffs is getting paid every single quarter. I'm watching the year. Sure, uh, they and it's illiquid. They can't use it for this kind of thing unless it's a self directed IRA. Um, yeah. So the value of having access to capital is is really the number one thing. So anybody with an entrepreneurial mind, we've been taught the exact opposite of what allows me to become an entrepreneur. And do you do you think that's a mistake, or do you think that was planned by the system? No, I mean it's definitely planned. I mean, there's a re I mean, dude, I have a finance degree from a very good college, and not one of those classes in the beginning they told you to even get a credit card. It's like what in the hell I can value some bullshit penny stock maybe, but I don't have a credit card. Like what is going on? How, how do they not teach you that right when you turn like right when you get in the eighth grade, he's like, Hey, get a credit card and get authorized user, something to start building it. And it's just insane to me. So, and they never talk about real estate. They never talk about how to uh, offset taxes. And what are they talking about? Whole game. What are they talking yeah. about? Oh, but so, what did they talk about in school? Like, what did you learn with the finance degree? Like how to read a portfolio and graphs? Yeah. How to, how to basically evaluate stocks, how to arbitrage currencies, how to do all that bullshit. What? Um, yeah. Yeah. That's the same. That's so, the like, thing you can do is arbitrage currency. Yeah. I mean, I remember sleeping through those classes and <laughs> I mean, I, I hated them. I, I knew I didn't want to get into stocks. That's just not my, not my cup of tea. I didn't want to trade anything like that. So I, I left college and I was like, I have no idea what I want to do. I like money. So I'm going to go try to make it. Yeah. And then it just so happened. I stumbled across real estate and fell in love with uh rental side, which kind of gives you all of those. So you got the cash flow, appreciation, uh, depreciation, tax write-offs. And uh, I, I forget the last one right now, but there, it's just, it's just amazing the way that it works and you can leverage it. Leverage it. Uh, the best way to get access to capital is having equity of an, in an asset that can be lent against. You cannot yeah. lend against a 401k. You cannot, no bank will lend against your IRA for two reasons. The first reason is that that money is pre tax The IRS hasn't taken their fair share. The number on the full, on your, I have a half a million in my IRA. No, you don't. Take it out. Take it out. Bring it to the office. You don't have a half a million. The I, they're going to tell you how much you want withheld for taxes. Oh, they don't tell you that until you, after you, you ask for the money. Like I have so many clients going, man, I can't even get to this. They're going to charge me this, this, and this. I'm like, yeah, man, what'd you think? Yeah. And then the second way, so the they won't lend against an IRA because it's pre-tax and because the market fluctuates. And so you mentioned you can borrow against a, a, a portfolio. Typically that's an after-tax portfolio and it's a percentage. So if I have a million in the a brokerage account, no one's going to lend a million dollars against that brokerage account. They'll lend about 50%. And if you get a good relationship, they'll go up to 70. I've heard 80 in some unique circumstances, but that's called collateral. The collateral is backing the loan, where if you default, they're going to take your brokerage account. That's why you can yeah, you don't. bank and borrow against the house, because if I default, the bank gets the house. Exactly. And so this is why we use cash value. Cash value is the only asset that, that I know that has guaranteed growth. The IRS loves you to do it because they're not going to tax the growth. They love it because you take care of your family with the death benefit. And banks will lend against the cash value. 
Okay. And here's the best way to get a cheap loan. The best way to get a low interest rate loan is to prove you don't need the money. If I went to a bank and said, look, I have 100,000 in cash value, or let's say 200,000 in cash value, and I want to pull out 100 grand, I don't want to use the cash value. Mr. Banker, I want to build a relationship with you, and I want to give you the opportunity to have a guaranteed loan that's backed by collateral that's guaranteed never to go down. By the way, there's no tax due. So instead of paying 7% that my neighbor is paying, I want to pay you 2%. And you can now negotiate that loan rate because the banker assumes no risk. If I default, they just take the cash value. And insurance companies know this too. They have forms. They already have them made out uh, collateral assignment forms. So I can assign the, the cash value as collateral to the bank and the bank says, here's your money. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that world as much. I want to get into it more. It's just, it's just awesome. And they don't teach you that stuff. So it's just learning how to access it and uh, tr getting around people like you that, that can, that can teach you at a high level. It's uh it's, it's amazing stuff. It is. And it's cool because of the internet and you know, 20 years ago, this, the education wasn't there and I don't think the higher ups like it. Um, yeah. Uh, I, <laughs> I don't know if I should talk about that. I got in trouble. I, someone tried to get me in trouble because they said that I was giving financial advice and they made up a lie saying that I lost someone $50,000 in the stock market that never even existed. And uh, they investigated me for nine months and it's like the scariest thing in the world, dude. You know, life insurance yeah. isn't an investment. And you can say that because there's no loss. You can't, right. you can't lose money. I've never lost a client's money. Is it a sexy 20% rate of return? No. Gosh, no. But when this S&P drops 20% and my cash value is going up, it sure is attractive. You know, when is the 0% rate of return good when the market loses, loses. And so this lady tried to like get me in trouble and, and they, they did the whole investigation and said, we're not going to, uh, I framed the letter that everything was false. It's in my office. I love it. <laughs> I see it every day. That's great. Yeah. So the value of all of these things is number one, you got to learn how to invest in yourself. And the, yeah. the best way to increase your income from what I hear you, the best way to in increase your situation and benefit, uh, grow your situation is to increase your income. And then controlling these assets by learning from people that 20 years ago, you didn't even have the opportunity to learn from. Absolutely. hundred percent. That's why I'm so glad you had a chance to get on here. Cause I, the real estate world is very exciting until the last 14 months. Yep. And everybody, yeah. on because people are making so much money, man. Like I, if you would have bought Airbnbs from 2017 to 2020, bro, they're killing it right now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, even that market's getting crazy oversaturated. So, like, that, in my opinion, came to a halting stop six months ago. Like, if you go on your Facebook, you're not seeing any arbitrage uh, Facebook ads anymore because it's saturated and nobody's making the money they were. So, basically, Airbnbs are cannibalizing one of another, one another and Airbnb is allowing it because their prices are going down. They're looking like the rock stars. So, that's getting different. That's changing. So, if you do want to get into that, that, avenue own the asset one i never teach arbitrage on that on that side own the asset make sure it works as a long-term rental and then if you can get icing on the cake uh on the upside for airbnb go ahead and do it but once that law changes in your city that it's gone and you bought off of airbnb cash flow you are screwed so dsc gun links right yeah you got to make sure you invest off of basic investing principles so you got to make i mean What's your rent going to be? What's going to be your principal interest tax insurance? Um, hopefully it's going to be locked for 20 to 30 years so you don't have to worry about floating rates. And then the only variable after that is going to be taxes. So what are your if your taxes are going to go up or not? And then you should be able to maybe do like a 30% mul uh, expense multiplier and then your net cash flows after that. So if you can make that work, especially right now at an 8, 8.5, maybe even 9% interest rate, that's going to be a great deal long-term because you also have to keep typically 25% equity in those houses. So if and when rates do drop, you can refinance and capture cash flow. That's what most people are only talking about right now is like cash flow this, cash flow that. It's like, okay, that's that's great. You need cash flow, but you also need equity. So if you, have, uh, if you do a, re a refinance, make sure you have 30%, 25% minimum equity. So when it does change, rate wise for the better, you can then create your cash flow on the back end. Yes. I used to say for my personal residence, I'd rather have equity in my life insurance than my house. Um, because I can get to my life insurance pretty easily. The flip side, if I have a big HELOC on my house, like I do, 
um, the, the, I can get to it easily, but it's twice as expensive as my life insurance. Yeah. And you're going to pay for it. Yeah. You're going to pay for it. It's two things I want to bring up and then, um, I'll let you go. But you mentioned, uh, Airbnbs, they could change the law for short-term rentals. Yeah. I live in Nashville, yeah. you know, Marriott, yeah. high, you think those, those big hotels like the idea of Airbnb? Absolutely not. No, and they had a lot more lawyers and influence than- A lot more money. A lot more money. And so the city is cracking down on Airbnb rentals. Um, and if you go to Broadway, my gosh, it's almost like they should. It's crazy downtown nowadays. But um, so here's a, a little, a, a secret that a friend of mine was telling me about. If you own an Airbnb, and let's say you bought it for 600 four years ago, you could sell for well over a million now. And you want to capture six years of cash flow in a sale and get rid of that asset, but you can capture that cash flow. Go do it. If that area is now zoned as no longer allowed Airbnb, and I sell that property to you, the new owner can't Airbnb it. So there's no reason for them to buy it. So here's how you get around that. Right. You put Airbnb, and this isn't legal advice, talk to your attorney, obviously, but you put the Airbnb in an LLC. And now when I sell the LL, the, when I sell the property, I transfer ownership of the LLC to the new owner. And then the new owner can continue to rent that property. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, there's always going to be loopholes, hopefully, of things. Um, and that's a great way to do it. Yeah. Uh, one more thing, too. You said, um, you, you started mentioning, a, a, you threw it out there off the cuff because you've obviously thought about this dozens of times. You mentioned a 30% calculation. Do you have tools or resources for people that can say, look, how do I, how do I see if this is a good deal or not? Yeah. Um, I got a free deal analyzer that I've built, um, on in my, in my Instagram or DM me, whatever. I, I can also give it to you as a link. Uh, bigger pockets has one too. So basically you just have to create, you just have to know that there is, okay, you have to manage the asset. That's eight to 12%, depending on your area, you're going to have vacancy. So five to eight to 10%, depending on the area, um, repairs. So you, things are going to break. You got to fix them. Another 5% CapEx. So roof, siding, windows, doors, furnace, uh, that's going to be another 5%. And there's one more that I'm not thinking of, but it usually ends up being about 25, 30% at the end of the day um, that you have to budget for. It doesn't right now come out all of it, but put it in the, in the operating account that you don't really touch. Because when you do have that bad eviction or you do have that person that destroys your house, if you're running on rent minus your debt service, you're going to have, and, and you think that's your cash flow, it's going all into that turn and then some. Yeah. And that can get eaten away so quickly. So fast. I mean, a good rental property for most people, net is $300. So a door. So a furnace costs $4,000 in some areas. So that's a whole year of cash flow right there, unless you're calculating it properly and setting aside that money for the calendar. Wow. Um, so if, if people want to find you, Instagram handle, we'll put all the links and stuff in the description so they can get a hold of you. And they can just reach out. And, and you said you, you have a kind of a calculator that yeah. you built? Yeah, okay. actually, shoot me a DM, um, Tommy R05. Love it, man. Tommy, I'm going to let you go, buddy. Any last thoughts before uh, we take off? No, I mean, I love the concepts that, you were, that you're creating. I mean, the, we didn't talk about it a whole lot, but change, getting out of your mindset that you need to have a steady job and creating a 1099 for yourself. So going out there and creating and learning a high paying skill like sales uh, to then go and just any day you wake up, you can go create something. So highly recommend learning that skill, whether it's wholesaling real estate, whether it's uh, selling insurance, whether it's something that they can't take from you because you can use those skills in different things. So being able to learn a high paying skill is very, very, very important and uh, take some risks. Um, it's good. It, everybody says it's risky, but it's really not. What's the risk it, that you go try it or the risk of you staying in this job forever and not actually live uh, life the way it's supposed to be lived? So, you know, about every that again. Yeah. So what's the, the investing in your in yourself or in your education and your ability versus giving money to Wall Street to the crooks in Manhattan in a government controlled asset called a qualified retirement account that you can't touch or use until you're 60 years old? That's gambling. I know people in their 60s that go, "Man, I wish I would have met you 20 years ago," because they're watching their account going down and they're taking the grandkids to Disney World. The mutual fund lost last year because the SP. That's risk. Yeah. Yeah. I have zero dollars. This isn't funny. I'm not, I'm not 
I'm not a proponent or against, you know, do whatever you want to do. I, you know, this is just opinions here. Yeah. I have zero dollars in a 401k. I'll never have one. Um, it just was never really an option for me. Uh, my, my right now, and I'm probably going to get into the life insurance side of it, the cash value stuff, but right now it's, it's, it's real estate. It's a hard, tangible asset. It spits off cash flow. If I own an asset for 10 years, it's going to go up in value. My debt is going to get paid down. And then I can refinance that property, capture that equity tax-free because it's debt and I can redo it again. So it, it's, it's a piggy bank that I control. Nobody else does. It's up to me to maintain it and to create the debt that I want on it where I pay the debt off and then I cash flow whatever the rent comes in. So, I mean, on a scale of one to 10, how, how fun is that too? Like on a scale of one to 10? It's, it's amazing. Um, it, <laughs> it's so cool. Just think, like once you get the bug and you understand what it can do, um, cause really the, the extracting equity portion of it is the real money. So you gotta think of it like, if I have a million dollar portfolio today, the cash flow may not be that great. It could be maybe, let's say it's so about $5,000 net. You can maybe replace your income with that. That's a very low cost living. But if I hold those assets another 10 years, that portfolio may be worth 1.5 or even 2 million. My debt on that property or on those properties, say in the beginning, it's 800,000. I've now paid that down over 10 years to 550. So if it's worth now 1.5 and I owe 550, I'm just gonna pull my calculator out here. I could restructure all of that debt at a 75% a loan to value. So they'll give me a loan for 1.125 million and I owe 550. So That's an extra half a million. I could pull out $600,000 almost tax free into my bank account and go live my life. And hopefully that real estate does what it typically does, which is rents go up, meaning you can cover the new debt service that you're creating already. And you now are a baller. Like you can do whatever the hell you want. You created your own ecosystem to where you never have to worry about any other people digging in your pockets. Yeah, man, debt is tax-free. I talk about that all the time. Buy, borrow, die, never sell. Uh, and if you do sell, roll the equity somewhere else so you never pay the tax. That's the idea. Yeah. But you mentioned, you know, five grand a month might be enough to replace your income. But think about this. We haven't calculated the rate of return of time. If I just stopped going to my nine to five, 40, 50 hours a week, let's say the five grand might replace my income. Maybe it doesn't replace my income. But if I quit that job, now I have all the time that I can turn the five grand into 10 grand or 15 grand. You, you can't calculate that. It, and it also the ability to think about it differently. That's the best way to look at it, especially if you have a higher paying job. Most people think the opposite. If I have a higher paying job, but I also, so like, for example, we have two gentlemen that we've mentored one-on-one, -on -one, the only people. They both make about $125,000 in their, their uh, engineering jobs. They're both in their mid-20s. They made $300,000 in their first year of real estate doing it part-time. Mm. But they're like, well, we don't want to leave our jobs. Like it's come, It's like, guys, what is what is your time worth? You guys are doing this on the side. Like you gotta, you gotta start respecting yourself, respecting your time, because you guys just created that doing it half-assed. <laughs> like, and like, believe in yourself. Take the leap of faith because it's scary. Yeah, everything's scary. But I don't want to have the what if moments when I'm sixty, like everybody else does. It's scary to me to stay in a position that I'm not in love with. That's what scares the crap out of me. When I, I say this all the time, but when I quit architecture, I called my mom and she cried. Here I am excited, like, I'm going to go do this. I want to go, I'm going to go move to Chicago. I'm going to change everything. I'm so excited about this. And then they're crying about the whole thing. I'm like, I can always go back and do drawings. I, I, I still have the degree. Yeah. That's what I tell them too. I'm like, guys, like there's going to be, there's going to be a need for engineers. Go try it. You're young enough that like, you got to try something. You know? Yeah. So yeah. I love Tommy, thanks so much for being here, man. We'll make sure to put all of the, the links for your stuff in the description. And I uh, appreciate the conversation, man. We'll do this again. Yeah, thanks for your time. I uh, love talking about that stuff. So like I said earlier, uh, DM me on Instagram. I, I'm, I'm an open book. Ask any question. I'll give you an honest answer. So uh, appreciate your time. Thank you for the platform. Thank you. If you ever need anything, if you're back in Columbus, you want to welcome, watch a Buckeyes game, I have a beer, I uh, would love, love to hang out. So I appreciate your time, man. No offense, I hope to God I never am. Uh, but if for some reason I am, I find myself there, I will call you absolutely. <laughs> now, vice versa. If you're in Nashville, I'll take you out anytime. Awesome. Appreciate it, brother. All right. Thanks, Tommy. See you, buddy.